Welcome to our first Engineers Newsletter live broadcast in 2005. I'm Mick Schwedler in Applications Engineer at Train, and I'll be both your host and a presenter as we discuss cooling towers and condenser water systems uh, from both a design and operation perspective. Over the past decade, cooling tower manufacturers, design engineers, controls providers, and utilities have examined the interaction between chillers and cooling towers. Today, we get a chance to share their perspectives. Joining us is Dave Guckelberger, also from our Applications Engineering Group. Dave will help us understand the fundamentals of chillers, cooling towers, and how one affects the other. Following Dave's presentation, I'll be back to discuss how and why the industry has changed its outlook on condenser water system design conditions. Lee Klein, a systems marketing engineer, will then take us through the control options available from a cooling tower standpoint and some condenser design layouts to address specific operating conditions. Finally, I'll be back to combine the control options Lee talks about with the fundamentals Dave addresses so that we can offer the building owner options to help reduce the energy usage and cost in their system throughout its operating range. After the presentations, we'll have our question and answer session. You can fax questions in at any time to the number on your screen. Now the examples we'll share today use centrifugal chillers, but the same concepts can be applied to any chiller type. In addition, 10 minutes after this originally scheduled broadcast, I'll be back with about a 30-minute Engineers Newsletter Live special edition. The subject is refrigerant selection, lead, prerequisites, and credits. There have been a number of changes to lead documents since October of 2004, and they're pretty significant. We hope you can take the time to stay with us and learn about some of these updates. Now let's get into the meat of our broadcast on cooling towers and condenser water systems and ask Dave to walk us through the fundamentals. Thanks, Mick. As Mick just mentioned, my section of today's broadcast is to help you understand how changes in load, ambient conditions, and tower selection affect the operation of a chiller. I'd like to start by reviewing the basics of the relationship between the chiller and the tower. After a brief look at how tower temperature affects chiller performance, I'll review the basics of tower terminology and operation. Let's start with a quick review of the refrigeration cycle. As shown on this slide, the basic physical components of the vapor compression cycle are the evaporator, the compressor, the condenser, and the expansion device. The compressor draws refrigerant vapor from the evaporator and discharges it into the condenser. The condenser rejects heat from the superheated compressed vapor, thereby changing it to a saturated liquid. This liquid refrigerant returns to the evaporator after passing through the expansion device. The pressure drop created by the expansion device causes part of the liquid refrigerant to evaporate and the remaining liquid to cool. Since we are showing a two-stage compressor, some of the flashed vapor is returned to the compressor via the economizer. Of course, other components are required to complete a chiller, but the ones just described are those required to outline the refrigeration cycle. Now let's take another look at this cycle, this time on a pressure enthalpy chart. The pressure enthalpy chart is a good visual reference for showing how changes in condensing temperature change the refrigeration effect and the amount of work done by the compressor. This slide shows a basic pressure enthalpy chart. Refrigerant pressure is indicated on the vertical axis and enthalpy on the horizontal axis. Combinations of pressure and enthalpy to the right of the curve indicate superheated vapor, and combinations to the left of the curve indicate subcooled liquid. Any point inside the curve indicates a mixture of saturated liquid and vapor. Enthalpy is a measure of heat content, both sensible and latent, per pound of refrigerant. It's important because it gives us a way to measure the refrigerating effect of our vapor compression cycle. Refrigeration effect occurs at a constant temperature and pressure. For example, point A represents a heat content of saturated liquid R123 at 5 PSIA and 34 degrees Fahrenheit. Point B represents the heat content of saturated vapor R123 at the same pressure and temperature, 
The difference in heat content, or enthalpy, between A and B is the amount of heat required to transform one pound of saturated liquid refrigerant to saturated refrigerant vapor at the same pressure and temperature. This refrigeration effect is what cools the water passing through the evaporator of a chiller. With that very quick introduction to the pH chart, let's jump right into plotting the centrifugal refrigeration cycle for a two-stage chiller. Refrigerant leaves the evaporator as saturated vapor at point one and enters the compressor. The compressor raises the pressure to point four in two steps. In between the two stages of compression, the refrigerant is slightly cooled by vapor from the economizer. This process is shown as point two to point three. The refrigerant entering the condenser at point four is superheated, but the condenser cools the superheated gas to point five, where, it, where condensation begins converting it from a gas to a liquid. By the time the refrigerant reaches point six, it's 100% liquid. The now liquid refrigerant goes through two expansion devices. As the hot liquid refrigerant drops in pressure, a portion of it flashes the vapor, which cools the remaining liquid. The flashed gas from the first drop in pressure is returned to the intermediate stage of the compressor, as shown by the dotted line from point seven to point three. Just before it enters the evaporator, the liquid refrigerant flows through the second expansion device, as indicated by point eight to point nine. And finally, the liquid refrigerant absorbs heat from the water flowing through the evaporator tubes, which causes it to boil, returning it to a gas, where it can again be drawn into the compressor at point one, allowing the cycle to start all over. As was shown on the last slide, the portion of the cycle from point nine to point one provides the refrigeration effect. The role of the compressor in this cycle is to move refrigerant from point one to point four. So the compressor must overcome the pressure differential between the evaporator and the condenser. The amount of work or power the compressor uses is proportional to this pressure differential. If the condensing pressure is higher, the compressor must work harder to lift the refrigerant to point four prime. This also shifts the enthalpy points as the refrigerant drops through the expansion devices and results in a reduction of the refrigeration effect for each pound of circulated refrigerant. For the chiller to maintain a constant cooling output, the compressor mass flow rate must increase. Condensing pressure is proportional to the chiller's leaving condenser water temperature. In short, raising the condenser leaving water temperature makes the chiller consume more energy for the same amount of cooling output. In a few minutes, Mick will discuss how this interaction between the chiller and the tower impacts system design. Regardless of the temperature, the interaction between the tower and the chiller is tied to the heat rejection rate of the chiller. In short, the tower determines the water temperature entering the condenser, but the rate at which the tower must reject heat is determined by the chiller. Heat rejection of the chiller is the sum of the evaporator load plus the energy input of the compressor. The energy input of the compressor is the work required to lift the refrigerant vapor from the evaporator pressure up to the condenser pressure. For a compressor connected to an electric motor, the input energy is electricity. In chillers with a hermetic motor design, all of the electrical energy input to the motor needs to be rejected as heat by the tower. In the case of an open drive electric chiller, the motor efficiency determines the amount of motor input that goes into the cooling tower as heat. For example, if the motor is 95% efficient, then 95% of the energy must be rejected by the cooling tower. The remainder of the motor heat is rejected to the space surrounding the motor and must be removed by exhaust fans or some other means. To simplify the calculations, we'll assume that all the motor heat is rejected to the cooling tower. As shown on the slide, the rate of heat rejection to the tower, Q, is the sum of the evaporator load plus the input energy to the compressor. A simple way to calculate Q is to use the COP, coefficient of performance. Let's look at an example. For each ton of evaporator load, the chiller must reject 12,000 BTUs per, per hour plus the electric energy input to the motor. For this example, we use the ASHRAE 90.1 minimum COP of 6.1. Inserting the COP into our equation, 
The total amount of heat rejected per ton of cooling is just under 14,000 BTUs per hour. The last part of heat rejection, and perhaps the most important for today's discussion, is to look at what happens to the temperature of the condenser water. The condenser water is warmed in proportion to both the heat rejection and the condenser water flow rate. As shown on the slide, the temperature rise is equal to the heat rejection rate Q divided by 500 times the flow rate in gallons per minute. Let's look at our example heat rejection at two flow rates, 3 GPM per ton and 2 GPM per ton. At 3 GPM per ton, condenser water temperature is increased 9.3 degrees as it goes through the condenser. Now remember from the pH diagram that as the condenser temperature rises, so does the condenser pressure, and as the condenser pressure rises, the compressor work increases. So when we lower the flow rate, the chiller COP goes down and the amount of heat to be rejected increases. With the combined effect of the lower flow and higher COP, the temperature rise at 2 GPM per ton is 14 degrees. At this point, you should have a basic understanding of the re relationship between condenser water temperature and the chiller operation. Now let's turn our attention to the cooling tower. ASHRAE defines a cooling tower as a heat transfer device, often tower-like, in which atmospheric air cools warm water, generally by direct contact. Viewed another way, it's a magic trick, where you throw hot water up in the air, and when it comes back down, it's cold water. The hard part is making the water fall back down at a particular temperature, and this requires a few more components. This figure shows the basic components of a cooling tower. The red pipe brings hot water to the tower, and spray nozzles distribute the water over fill. The fill improves evaporation by increasing the amount of water surface area exposed to the air. Evaporation cools the water as it falls through the fill and into the sump at the base of the cooling tower. From here, the cooled water is pumped back to the chiller. The final component is a fan used to pull or push air through the cooling tower's fill, speeding the rate of evaporation. Hot and cold are relative terms. In the cooling tower industry, hot water is the water coming to the tower, and the cooled or cold water is the water leaving the tower. There are certainly other components required to complete a tower, but for today's discussion, tower function is more important than tower construction. The last piece of the fundamentals portion of this broadcast is to look at cooling tower thermal performance. When it comes to tower performance, ambient wet bulb temperature is the primary uncontrollable factor that drives tower design and selection. Design wet bulb for various locations can be found in the ASHRAE Fundamentals Handbook. It's labeled evaporation and has columns for 0.4%, 1%, and 2%. These percentages represent the amount of time the wet bulb temperature exceeds the stated value. The 0.4% wet bulb temperature is the most conservative. This wet bulb temperature will only be exceeded for 0.4% of the hours in a year about 35 hours. A combination of wet bulb and cooling tower design determine two key performance factors of the tower, approach and range. Approach is defined as the difference between the ambient wet bulb temperature and the tower cold water temperature. Range is simply the temperature difference between the hot water entering the tower and the cold water leaving the tower. From a chiller's perspective, this is the condenser delta T that we calculated in the last section. And the last, but not least, parameter of cooling tower performance is the flow rate of hot water delivered to the cooling tower. Just as ARI develops standards used to define the testing of chillers, CTI, the Cooling Technology Institute, develops standards for cooling towers. CTI, CTI also provides a certification program to verify cooling tower performance. Performance within the following limits can be certified. Ambient wet bulb between 60 and 90 degrees. Approach must be greater than 5 degrees. Range must be greater than 4 degrees. And entering hot water temperature must be less than 125 degrees Fahrenheit. 
The important point to remember is that there isn't a standard set of conditions for cooling tower selection. Towers receiving CTI certification have predictable performance over a wide operating map. Let's look at how varying the cooling tower parameters affects performance by making a few tower selections. All of our selections will be made for a 500 ton chiller at a design wet bulb of 78 degrees using a certified tower selection program. As I just mentioned, cooling towers can be selected over a wide variety of conditions. However, in HVAC applications, they were traditionally selected for a 7 degree approach and a flow rate of 3 GPM per ton. For the base case, we'll use the traditional selection criteria. The slide shows the results. At 3 GPM per ton, the hot water temperature is 94.3 degrees and the tower requires a 40 horsepower fan. Now let's make some changes. First we'll look at what happens when we drop the flow rate from 3 GPM per ton to 2 GPM per ton. We are rejecting the same amount of heat so the lower flow rate results in an increased range of 14 degrees. Using the same size tower as in the last selection, an interesting thing happens. The approach temperature drops from 7 degrees to 4 degrees. The 4 degree approach yields a cold water temperature of 82 degrees. Adding the 14 degree range means the tower hot water temperature is 96 degrees. In summary, we can see that for the same tower, when we reduce the flow rate, the tower approach temperature is reduced and the range is increased. In the previous example, we kept the same tower design. This time, let's look at what happens if we choose to hold the approach to 7 degrees when the water flow rate is reduced. As before, with the flow rate reduced, rejecting the same amount of heat means that the range is 14 degrees. With the 7 degree approach, this makes the hot water temperature 99 degrees. Although evaporation gives it some unique characteristics, in basic terms, the cooling tower is simply a heat exchanger. It exchanges heat between the hot water temperature, in this case 99 degrees, and the ambient wet bulb. Increasing the difference between the hot water temperature and the ambient means that less heat exchange area is required. In a cooling tower, this can mean a smaller tower or moving less airflow across the tower fill. So back to our example. Our most recent set of tower parameters resulted in multiple selections. They range from towers smaller than the previous selection, but with similar horsepower requirements, to larger towers with smaller fan motors. If we chose a tower the same size as the last selection, the fan horsepower drops by nearly 40%. These are certainly not the only choices we could have made. You could, for instance, choose a combination that would result in reducing both the fan horsepower and the box size of the cooling tower. The important aspect to remember is that cooling towers can easily be selected with predictable performance at a wide range of flow rates and conditions. The final step is to look at how changes in load and wet bulb temperature affect the tower performance. As we mentioned earlier, in a chilled water system, the amount of heat being rejected is the evaporator load plus the heat of compression. At a constant flow rate, the condenser delta T will be nearly proportional to load. That is, with a design delta T of 10 degrees, at 50% load, the delta T is about 5 degrees. At the tower, the range follows the chiller delta T. So range is basically proportional to load. So far, this seems intuitive. Also intuitive is that as the range or load is reduced, so is the approach. For, an, for example, at an ambient wet bulb of 78 degrees, when the range is reduced from 10 degrees to 5 degrees, the approach goes from 7 degrees to 4 degrees. Said another way, as the amount of heat to be rejected goes down, it becomes easier to make cold water. The next relationship may not seem as intuitive. At a constant load, as the wet bulb goes down, the approach temperature goes up. With a 100% load and a 78 degree wet bulb, the approach is about 7 degrees. However, at the same load and a 45 degree wet bulb, the approach temperature is more than doubled to 16 degrees. So the coldest water the tower could produce is 61 degrees. This same pattern exists for part load operation of the tower. At 50% load, the approach is 4 degrees when the wet bulb is 78 degrees. 
When the wet bulb is 45 degrees, the approach temperature is more than doubled to 9 degrees. As I said, this concept is not intuitive, but data from any cooling tower manufacturer will show this phenomenon. One way to think of it is that it's harder to evaporate water as the wet bulb goes down. So for a given load, the approach temperature goes up as wet bulb goes down. If you want to learn more about cooling tower performance, Marley has a good basic theory publication available. The reference page at the end of today's presentation provides a link to the Marley document. That wraps up the fundamental section of the broadcast. We've seen that towers and chillers can both be selected over a wide range of operating conditions. We've also taken a look at how those variations affect performance. Now Mick will show us how to use these fundamentals to select the best combination of chiller and tower for your building. Over to you, Mick. Thanks for walking us through those fundamentals, Dave. Um, in the past, many chilled water systems were designed with a rule of thumb of three gallons per minute per ton. And that resulted years ago in a 10 degree temperature difference. At today's more efficient chillers using this condenser water flow rate give a 9.3 to 9.4 degree delta T. After hearing Dave's discussion about lower water flow, reducing cooling tower fan size or power, let's take a look at the industry's design advice today, specifically with respect to reducing tower flow rates and increasing temperature difference. A number of studies have been performed and a, a few of them are cited here. First, Pacific Gas and Electric published a Cool Tools Chilled Water Plant Design Guide in 2000. In it, they recommend increasing the condenser delta T from the old norm. The guide suggests 10 to 15 degrees F for single stage chillers and up to 18 degrees for multiple stage compressors or positive displacement chillers. From a consulting engineer's standpoint, Kelly and Shan and later Chan only published articles that recommend reducing flow rates to 2 GPM per ton which results in just over a 14 degree delta T. And from the industry standpoint, the ASHRAE Green Guide cites a PG&E Cool Tools manual and uses delta T's between 12 and 18 degrees for chillers. So they all point to reducing the water flow rate through the chiller's condenser. Why the change? Well, we often think of KW per ton for a chiller a better measure of chiller efficiency is COP, or coefficient of performance. We can calculate it by dividing 3.516 by the KW per ton. For COP, higher is more efficient. Now this chart summarizes the dramatic improvements in chiller efficiency during the last three decades. It shows the minimum requirements per ASHRAE standard 90 between 1977 and 1999, as well as efficiency requirements in the New Building Institute's Advanced Building Guidelines and the best efficiency we could find today. So in just over 25 years, the minimum required efficiency of chillers has increased 50 to 60 percent. That's huge, and that's not even the best chillers. In that same time frame, both condenser water pumps and cooling towers have seen very minor efficiency increases, mostly in motor efficiency. That's why those involved at PG&E, Kelly and Shan, and ASHRAE investigated and found that reducing flow rates is a good idea. So let's walk through the process, then a quick example. As we do this, keep in mind two important concepts. The condenser side of the chiller plant has three power consuming devices, the cooling tower, condenser water pump, and chiller. And the meter is on the building. This is what the building owner pays for. Now let's look at how a system could be put together. Proper chiller selection is a necessity. All major chiller manufacturers have chiller selection certified by the Air Conditioning and Refrigeration Institute, or ARI. This ensures that the chiller performs as selected. Selections can be made at any condenser water flow rate and temperature, and we can get both full and part load data. In the same way as Dave mentioned earlier, cooling towers are rated by the Cooling Technology Institute. 
For today's example, we'll use a manufacturer selection program for cooling tower data, both at full and part load. We'll use these familiar equations to calculate the energy consumption of the condenser water pump. Here, delta P represents pressure drop in feet of head. So pump's power is related to the flow rate and pressure differential it must overcome. The pressure drops that the condenser water pumps must overcome are a function of the rest of the system. The water must be pumped through the condenser bundle, through the pipes, valves, and fittings in the system, and the pump must overcome the static lift between the basin of the tower and the top of the tower. Let's look at an example. I can assure you that this example will not be your chilled water plant, but you can use the same method to do your own investigation. The base design is a 500 ton chilled water system. This slide shows the assumptions made about the system. In the past, many systems used these design parameters on the condenser water side, 78 degrees, 85 degrees entering the con chiller's condenser, and a flow rate of 3 GPM per ton, which corresponds to 1,500 GPM. Remember that at ARI standard conditions, to meet the ASHRAE standard 90.1 requirements, the maximum KW per ton for a 500 ton centrifugal chiller is 0.576. We selected one as close as to this as possible and got a condenser water pressure drop of almost 26 feet. At 286 full load KW, this selection is a little bit more efficient than the ASHRAE requirement. Here's the cooling tower data for our base design. It's selected at the 94.3, 85, 78 conditions. What results is a 40 horsepower cooling tower with 13 feet of static lift from the tower's base to its distribution system. A 40 horsepower fan gives us 31.2 kW. And here are the power requirements for the condenser water pump. The total pressure drop is 69 feet of head. Using the previous pump power equation, this gives about 28 kW. Looking at the system, we get 346 kW for the chiller plus condenser water pump plus cooling tower fan power. The question is this, since the meter's on the building, is there anything we can do to make the system better? Let's try Tumin Shan's recommendation and reduce the condenser water flow rate from 3 GPM per ton to 2 GPM per ton. For our example, we'll reduce the condenser water flow rate, but keep the same pipes and the same cost chiller. Remember that piping pressure drop goes down with the square of the flow rate. As Dave showed us in the cooling tower fundamentals discussion, we can change the cooling tower size as appropriate since the larger temperature difference permits us to use a smaller cooling tower. The chiller KW must go up because its leaving condenser water temperature is increased. ASHRAE 90.1 allows an upward adjustment in KW per ton when the condenser water flow rate is reduced. In this case, a same cost chiller gives us just under an 18 foot condenser pressure drop in 0.614 kW per ton. The tower selected for this alternative uses 25 horsepower with the same static head. Note that it costs about 10% less than the tower in our base chilled water plant design. So the installed cost of the system is less since the pump is smaller and the cooling tower costs less. The flow rate is reduced to 1000 GPM. The pressure drop through the system changes with the square of the flow, so it goes from 30 to 13.3 feet, assuming the same pipe size for now. By adding the pressure drop to the new condenser bundle pressure drop and the tower static lift, we calculate a condenser water pump KW of 10.7. When we look at the system power at full load, it's reduced. While the chiller power increased, that increase was more than offset by the reduction in pump and cooling tower fan power. Remember, the chiller cost is the same, the pipes are the same, and the cooling tower costs 10% less. So we've reduced power at full load 
and reduced installed costs. Impossible? No. It's the reason PG&E and Chan made their recommendations. But we need to remember that the meter is on the building and most often the system operates at part load conditions. What happens then? When the system is at part load, the condenser water pump still operates at full KW. For this example, we'll assume that the operator has decided to make the cooling tower water temperature as cold as possible. So the cooling tower fan operates at 100% since we're trying to drive the condenser water temperature down. Now we'll discuss whether or not that's a good idea later. The chiller unloads and the result is that at all part load points the system energy consumption is reduced. In fact, it's really these part load operating energy reductions that net the largest savings. Now as a system designer it's important to understand that you have design options that you can use to satisfy the specific needs of each of your customers. You can reduce the installed cost of the pumps and tower by downsizing them and realize the full energy or operating cost savings of their smaller power draw. This is also applicable in a retrofit application where the pipes aren't being replaced. Or since we're reducing flow, it may be to the owner's benefit to further cut installed costs by reducing the pipe size. The last time we checked, steel prices were still pretty high. If the pipe size is reduced, the piping pressure drop will not drop as quickly, so this results in less pump energy savings. By reducing the pipe sizes, we also reduce the materials that go into the building. This can be another environmental benefit. Chan notes that the structural costs for the smaller cooling tower and the support for the pipes, as well as the water in them, is greatly reduced. In some applications, you can use a portion of the first cost savings from the pumps, tower, and pipes to install a more efficient chiller. So with those options available, let's look at some questions that are often asked when it comes to reducing condenser water flow rates. First, is reduced flow only for long piping runs? Let's start with our previous example. The condenser water pump must always overcome the pressure drop through the condenser bundle and the tower static lift. In our base case, we assumed that a pressure drop through pipes, valves, and fittings of 30 feet of head. What would happen if the original system had no pipes, valves, or fittings, so that portion of the pressure drop was zero? Here's how our system energy consumption looks. With zero piping pressure drop, the full load system power increased a little, 1.5 kW, because the chiller kW went up by more than the pump plus tower savings. However, at all part load points, the system energy consumption is reduced when we reduce condenser water flow rate. By the way, the break-even pressure drop that makes the system KW the same at full load is only 5 feet. So even when the cooling tower is directly above the chiller, a very short piping run, there's a chance to save system operating costs. The next question, is reduced flow good for all chiller manufacturers? Uh, you've undoubtedly seen white papers from train and other manufacturers and we seem to come to different conclusions. So rather than ask us, let's look at some actual jobs. Demerchian noted in his IDEA paper that Logan Airport was able to reduce pipe sizes when they reduced flow rates. They saw savings of almost half a million dollars in installed costs and 7.3% operating cost savings. DuPont in Greenville, South Carolina found a different reason for using low flow systems. They had a large built up cooling tower. By moving to a reduced flow design, the cooling tower and its sump were significantly reduced in size. This saved them $45,000 in excavation and concrete costs for that sump. In addition, they were able to significantly reduce operating costs. 
Pacific Gas and Electric commissioned a study of reduced flow systems and savings for Hewlett Packard. It was found that reducing flow rates saved operating costs even when they reduced their pipe sizes to save installed costs. These three plants use chillers from the three major manufacturers. Although I'm happy to report that at least trained chillers were installed at DuPont. So the advantages of reducing the flow are reduced installed and operating costs no matter whose chillers are installed. A third question is often asked. Uh, this looks okay for new systems, but how about retrofits? I get to speak with building owners and engineers quite often. About every two weeks when I give this example, the engineer will turn to the owner or vice versa and say, Boy, that's exactly our system. Here's a scenario. It's time to replace the chiller, but the cooling load has increased. The cooling tower had rotted out two years ago and was replaced. The condenser piping goes under the parking lot, but it's in good shape, as is the condenser pump. This probably sounds familiar to at least one person in your location. We have an existing 500 ton chiller with 1500 GPM of condenser flow. The tower was selected at 95, 85, 78 conditions. The capacity we want now is 750 tons, a 50% increase. If we reselect the tower at different conditions, we find that it can easily reject the additional heat. By selecting the chiller properly, taking the condenser water temperature from 88 to 102.5 degrees F, we can get up to 50% more capacity and install a 750 ton chiller using the same condenser water pump, pipes, and cooling tower. Now, I've seen a lot of jobs come back into budget this way. When doing an analysis on a specific job, now, don't just take the four load points like I showed in the example. Some people perform bid analysis or spreadsheet calculations. If you do, please remember that the outside air dry bulb and load are not correlated to one another. Many buildings are internally loaded. Also, Getting actual cooling tower performance, that is the power and cold water temperature, is really hard to do correctly in a spreadsheet. You can make assumptions, but the output is only as good as those assumptions. Getting the load, coincident wet bulb temperatures, and leaving tower water temperature from a spreadsheet, it's a gamble. So what programs can be used? Shown here is a screenshot of System Analyzer that can be used in less than half an hour to perform a scoping analysis. In his engineer's newsletter on this topic, Don Eppelheimer used a program called Chill Chiller Plant Analyzer for his analysis. It calculates a load profile and uses actual ambient wet bulb temperatures. Because it uses the same equipment simulation of the full energy analysis program, Trace 700. This tool can take about an hour to use. Finally, Trace 700, Carrier's HAP program, and the DOE simulation programs give you the chance to analyze very detailed information and comply with ASHRAE 90.1 or USGBC LEED modeling requirements if necessary. Accurate analysis doesn't have to take days of work. The bottom line, there are more and more design engineers reducing condenser water flow rates because it's good for their customers' businesses since it saves installed and operating costs. We've provided a bibliography so you can look at third-party information to see this. The PG&E Cool Tools Design Guide suggests that you start at a flow rate, we might suggest 2 GPM per ton, but then adjust it because there's no magic flow rate that's always perfect. Also consider reinvesting a portion of the first cost savings from the pipe, pumps, and towers into even more efficient chillers. And always, always remember that the meter is on the building. But there's even more to it than first cost and energy savings. When we save energy at the power plant, we reduce environmental emissions. As Chan so aptly notes, this reduction of first cost, operating cost, 
and environmental emissions is a win-win-win situation for us as well as generations to come. We now understand the design conditions and options available to us as we work with building owners. Let's move to the next portion of the broadcast. Lee Klein is here to discuss how the cooling tower fans can be controlled, as well as making sure the system configuration and controls allow for proper operation throughout the chilled water system's operating range. Thanks, Mick. As Mick said, we're going to overview some tower control basics. There are many rules of thumb as well as myths concerning cooling tower control. As with any system, there are two main functions the controls need to address. Capacity control and equipment or system protection. We'll break these down a little further as shown here and discuss them in this segment. Mick talked about selecting design conditions for a condenser water system. Although ASHRAE does not prescribe system design conditions because they should be optimized per application, ASHRAE 90.1 does, however, prescribe some tower-specific minimum energy efficiencies. First, there are limits to the maximum fan power per GPM of water flow, although they are stated in the reciprocal of that. The limits you see here basically prevent the designer from selecting a tower that passes a lot of air over a really small tower. ASHRAE 90.1 also dictates some control requirements. These tower fan control requirements are intended to ensure that efficient tower capacity control occurs. The key requirement is that once an individual cooling tower fan motor is 7.5 horsepower or larger, it is required to have the capability to reduce its speed to two-thirds or less. Quite often today, this is done with a variable frequency drive but is sometimes done with a two-speed or pony motor. I'll look at the usage of this fan speed control later in the presentation. There are a number of exceptions to this requirement. Three are listed here. First, when there are multiple fans, one-third of them may have simple on-off control. So, on a three-cell cooling tower, only two need to have speed control. This is, of course, assuming manifolded tower sumps so that the overall tower capacity be, can be controlled with fan sequencing. The second exception is when there are multiple refrigeration circuits on the same fan. In such cases, fan control is often critical to ensuring proper unit operation. And a third exception to the requirement for fan speed control is installations in climates that have a high number of cooling degree days. Examples of locations where this applies are shown on the slide. Let's examine why ASHRAE has this fan speed control requirement. Usually a specific cooling tower cold water temperature is required. During system operation, the ambient wet bulb temperature and the thermal load change. This impacts the cold water temperature produced by the tower. This graph from a tower selection program shows that for a given thermal load, without capacity control, the cold water temperature drops significantly re with reduced ambient wet bulb. Similar operation occurs, although not as dramatic, with reduced thermal load at a fixed ambient wet bulb. And of course, the two effects are compounded at reduced wet bulb and reduced thermal load. The most common form of cooling tower control is airflow modulation. Tower capacity is approximately proportional to airflow as shown on this slide. An interesting characteristic to note is that even with the fans off, about 15% of the design airflow is induced through the cooling tower by convection currents. So about 15% of the heat rejection capacity is available with the fan completely off. Let's examine the impact of various types of fan control and therefore tower capacity modulation on tower energy consumption. Some often used fan control methods include constant speed fans with on-off cycling control, two-speed fans cycling between off, low, and high speed, and modulating the fan speed with a variable frequency drive on the cooling tower fan motor. Finally, more seldomly applied because of their lower energy efficiency are centrifugal blower fans with modulating dampers in conjunction with two-speed motors. If we consider airflow modulation and fan motor power, 
what we find is that based on the fan laws, fan power is proportional to the cube of the fan speed. So, as we modulate the fan speed to accomplish tower capacity control, we take advantage of this fan law phenomenon. So, at 50% fan speed, the power is 0.5 cubed, or 12.5% of design power. This correlation of fan power and speed is shown on the slide. Reducing fan speed even a little, even 20 to 30 percent, yields significant fan power savings. This impacts not only the control for the tower, but as we'll discuss later, the optimum tower cold water set point. Let's compare this VFD operation to other typical control methods. For a single fan tower with a single speed fan motor, the fan cycles between full speed and off to modulate tower capacity. When its energy use is averaged out over its runtime, the energy use will follow the orange line. The energy savings for VFD over single speed fan cycling is the entire area between these two curves. Also, with single speed fan cycling, since the tower capacity goes from 15% to 100% and back as the fan cycles, the tower cold water temperature will vary significantly. Although not typically damaging, it is not conducive to stable chilled water temperature control. A second control option some apply is, two, is a two-speed fan, with a low speed being 50% airflow. While this option saves significant energy over single speed control, a variable frequency drive still uses less energy. A VFD will also maintain a more constant tower water temperature. Finally, some apply a two-speed fan with a low speed at 67% airflow. Another way to do this is to have a smaller pony motor. Again, the VFD saves more energy than this method. It should not be surprising that a true variable speed fan has the lowest energy consumption and best controllability of any of these options. What about a cooling tower with two fans or two tower cells serving a common load? If both fans have variable frequency drives, they will operate together and the power consumption of the two fans will be reduced to the cube of the fan speed. With two single speed fans, one fan can cycle off and on. The first fan can satisfy up to about 65% of the total cooling tower load. Above this point, the second fan cycles. The energy savings potential using variable speed control is again the area between the two curves. How about if one of the fans is a two-speed and the other a single speed? The first fan comes on at low speed. When it can no longer meet the tower set point, it will move to high speed. If the water temperature rises again, the single speed fan will come on and the two-speed fan will move to low speed. Finally, both fans will operate at high speed. Whoa, lots of control relays and starters clicking on and off there. This does save energy over single speed fans, but as expected, there is significant energy reduction available through the use of VFDs. A few times I've seen a sequence where two fans with VFDs are controlled in series rather than in parallel. Let's look at why this misses much of the energy savings possible from the investment in the VFDs. Here we see the capacity versus energy curve if one fan is started and run up to full speed and held there while the second fan is started and run up to full speed. Once again, we see the significant energy difference represented by the area between that method and the one represented by modulating the fans together. Basically, there are three takeaways so far. ASHRAE 90.1 has definite control requirements, and we've just seen why. The exact same tower can have significantly different operating energy consumption depending on how it's controlled. And it makes sense to invest in VFDs on condenser fans. In addition to the energy and controllability advantages we discussed, it reduces fan, tower fan drive maintenance because it eliminates the shock associated with starting, stopping, or changing the fan speed. Often, we get asked if one fan should be run up to full speed before the second is started. From the chart on the previous slide, it's obvious that when there are multiple fans, all fans on active cells should be run at low speed before any fans are run at high speed. Or, if VFDs are applied, 
then the fan should be operated in parallel at equal speeds to control capacity. In your handouts, you'll see a slide that has some simple language that we've seen used for, as a starting point for sequences to specify fan control. We've included it here for your reference. Let's transition and switch from discussing control issues related to tower capacity control to discussing control issues related to protecting the chiller or tower. Let's start with examining chiller requirements and how to comply with them. When a chiller is in operation, the condenser to evaporator refrigerant pressure differential must be met and maintained. This relates to the cooling tower control because the evaporator pressure is set by the leaving evaporator water temperature and the condenser pressure is set by the leaving condenser water temperature. If the cold tower water temperature is too low at design flow, the chiller will not be able to achieve or maintain the leaving condenser water temperature that causes the required differential pressure. Generally, minimum refrigerant differential pressure control is a startup issue. All chillers, no matter what manufacturer, require a minimum pressure differential within a prescribed time period following startup. The pressure required depends on the type of chiller, the refrigerant, and the specific design of the chiller, but this requirement is universal to all chillers. This pressure differential is required to provide for two or three chiller functions. In all cases, the pressure differential supports the proper return of oil from the compressor bearings and also sufficient refrigerant flow through the chiller's refrigeration metering device. For some chillers, the pressure differential is also used for motor cooling or compressor oil supply. Let's take a closer look at an example of a startup after a cold weekend where the chilled water plant has not operated and the tower sump temperature is 40 degrees. On Monday morning, the building warms up such that there's a small load on the chiller, let's say 20%. The chiller starts and begins making 44 degree chilled water. With a 40 degree entering cold tower water, the condenser leaving water temperature will be about 42 degrees, which means that the condenser pressure is below the refrigerant, evaporator refrigerant pressure. Clearly, any chiller functions that depend on refrigerant pressure differential are not going to work properly. Depending on the chiller's design, you may have between a few seconds and 15 minutes to get the chiller's condenser pressure at a higher point than the evaporator pressure. Controlling the refrigerant pressure differential between the evaporator and the condenser of a water-cooled chiller is accomplished by varying either the entering water temperature or flow rate of water flowing through the condenser. There are five common methods used to control condensing pressure. We'll discuss each in some detail. Of course, first we can control the temperature of the water leaving the cooling tower by cycling the fans or varying their speed. But in many cases, this will not raise the condenser pressure quickly enough. If the condenser water system has a large water volume, which is cooled off after a cold weekend shutdown, or if the system is coming out of a free cooling operating mode. Another way to raise tower cold water temperature is to use a cooling tower bypass pipe to mix warmer condenser water with the colder tower water as illustrated here. This will clearly cause the water to warm faster than if it is passed over the top of the cooling tower. But if the condenser water system is large with a large volume and a large thermal mass of water, it may not be fast enough depending on the chiller type and startup load. So we probably have to do something with flow. It's important to note that this method of control, as well as others, may cause reduced water flow over the cooling tower fill. We'll discuss the problems this can cause in a few minutes. But because the flow will be reduced for a limited amount of time to gain control of refrigerant differential pressure, it's OK to pass a lower water flow over the tower. A different and often used strategy is to modulate flow to raise chiller condenser leaving water temperature. Remember, the condenser refrigerant pressure is set by the condenser leaving water temperature. The simplest method of flow control is to apply a throttling valve to restrict the flow of water through the condenser. This valve is often controlled based on the measured chiller refrigerant differential pressure. It only modulates during periods of very cold tower water. Under normal operating conditions, it's wide open. 
Sometimes it is desired to have constant flow over the tower and around the system. Maybe because a plate frame free cooling heat exchanger is in operation. In this case, flow through the chiller can be controlled using a chiller bypass pipe to vary the flow rate of water through the condenser. To the chiller, this is the same as using a two-way throttling valve. But controllability may be somewhat easier with this configuration since the pump pressure will remain constant rather than riding up the pump curve as it would if the flow were simply throttled. Finally, a variable frequency drive can be applied on the condenser water pump to vary the water flow rate through the condenser. This is not only a more energy efficient way to reduce flow, but it has another benefit as well. Let's shift our focus for a moment and talk about commissioning design flow through condensers. Every chiller plant I've been in has a triple duty valve throttled down, sometimes way down, to limit the flow through the chiller to its design value. If a VFD is there to modulate flow during times of low condenser water temperature, it can be set up such that during normal operating conditions, it's only run fast enough to produce design flow with all balancing valves wide open. Over the life of a chiller plant, this can save significant pumping energy. Each of these strategies has its advantages and disadvantages, and selection of the appropriate condensing temperature control strategy depends on the specific application. As you proceed, remember that all chillers need a minimum pressure differential to stay online. The goal is to ensure that the system can reach this pressure differential through proper system design. Once again, in your handout is a simple sequence of operation paragraph that can be used for, as a starting point for specifying head pressure control. Because head pressure control is critical to the reliable operation of any water-cooled chiller, and the requirements vary by chiller design, some designers are assigning the responsibility to perform this control to the chiller manufacturer. This may be a good way to reduce potential finger pointing. This shot slide shows two pieces of literature that deal with condenser water control for train centrifugal and helical rotary water-cooled chillers. These are available from your train account manager. I'll finish up here by touching on a tower issue that is often overlooked. Engineers and owners are often keenly aware of the fact that the chiller heat exchangers have operating flow limits. Every once in a while, an enterprising operator or engineer decides to play with an existing chiller's condenser water flows and forgets that there is another flow device at the other end of the pipe. That, of course, would be the tower, and it has operating flow limits, too. Chiller heat exchangers have a fairly wide operating flow range. For rating purposes, chillers are selected to run at a particular flow within that wide range. Towers, however, are typically designed and optimized around a very specific flow and the allowable flow range is typically quite narrow, almost always narrower than that of the chiller. The example numbers on this slide clearly demonstrate this situation. These flow limits are typically not an issue unless someone is trying to optimize the system operation by splitting the flow over multiple tower cells or if someone turns on an extra pump without opening a tower isolation valve first. Operating a tower outside its design flow range for long periods of time is inefficient and can result in harm to the tower. This slide lists some of the potential problems. Running towers for short periods of time with below rated minimum flows, as may happen if the flow is limited to control chiller refrigerant pressure, is not a problem for towers. However, overflowing towers, even for short periods of time, should be avoided to prevent the uncontrolled loss of treated water. Wider tower operating flow ranges are available. If a wider range is required, it must be clearly specified in the plans and specs. You should consult with a tower manufacturer to determine what is possible for any given job. Well, I think I've about run out of my allotted time. Remember that you can fax in your questions to the number on the screen at any time. We'll take some of them after Mick is finished telling us how we can take the control methods I just covered and use them to find the tower operating point that reduces system energy consumption. Just one more comment. As you're listening to Mick, remember that optimal or near optimal control point changes throughout the year. I think you'll understand why that's important 
by the time he's done. Take it away, Mick. Thanks for taking us through those control options, Lee. Um, now, let's take a simple case of a chiller and a cooling tower. They work together in that they're connected by condenser water temperature. Outside of this connection, the chiller power is dependent on the load and its design. The tower operation is dependent on the ambient conditions, heat rejection load, and its design. The question we'll answer now is, what's the right condenser water temperature? Now, some options of condenser water control are shown here. If we let the condenser water temperature stay at design, keep it hot, we minimize tower fan energy consumption. That's good. But we increase chiller energy consumption, and that's bad. If instead we drive the condenser water temperature down and make it cold, we minimize the chiller energy consumption, and that's good. But we increase the tower energy consumption, and that's bad. Uh, there must be some way to optimize the sum of the chiller plus tower energy consumption. Let's examine how we might find that optimal point. Now, this figure shows us a chiller and tower interaction at a specific point in time. The graph shows a system that's operating at 60% of its capacity, and the chiller and tower were selected at standard conditions. Right now, the ambient wet bulb is 65 degrees. The coldest water temperature the tower can produce is 73 degrees. Now it would have to run its fan at full speed and kW to do this. If instead the tower fans were operated at half speed, the tower would produce 79 degree water. The chiller reacts along the purple line. The colder the condenser water temperature, the more efficient the chiller is. And, and that's not quite a straight line. If we were trying to optimize the system, where would we set the cooling tower sump temperature controller? At this point in time, at about 79 degrees. And by doing so, we'd reduce our energy use by over 10%. Remember, this is one point in time with the chiller at 60% load and the ambient wet bulb temperature at 65 degrees. To optimize the system throughout the year, this calculation must be done continually. So let's look at how much operating costs can be saved, then discuss the parameters necessary to perform this control and how you might specify it. How much energy or operating costs can be saved during the year depends on the system design, the location, and the specific building use. Let's look at an example. We'll take a 720,000 square foot hotel with two chillers and cooling tower cells. The design capacity changes depending on our local design conditions. Uh, three control strategies will be examined. First, make the tower water temperature as cold as possible, or use optimal control, or set the leaving tower set point at the design condition. We assume this is 85 degrees in humid climates and 80 degrees in dry climates. Here we show four North American locations with significantly different loads, climates, and ability to use economizers. It's obvious that the absolute savings available varies by location, due mainly to the load profile and weather. The savings can be compared with the installed costs to determine the return on investment, or ROI, and help us make the proper financial decision. Now, for those who do international work, how about locations outside of North America? Again, depending on climate, the absolute savings vary. For example, in Paris, which is a mild, dry climate, an economizer greatly reduces the need for mechanical cooling. However, in Singapore and Dubai, the savings by finding the optimal temperature control are much larger due to the longer cooling season. Now, some people may note that in Singapore, keeping the tower temperature near design is good. This is because the wet bulb is so high that the system can never get down to a 55 degree tower set point, so the tower fans would run continually. That does not optimize the system. If we look at the available savings, we see variations from 2% to 14% annually when using optimal control 
instead of simply making the water temperature as cold as possible. Are these savings worthwhile? When I first started talking about chiller tower optimization concepts in the early 1990s, some engineers who were more experienced told me that 5% or so really wasn't very significant. Uh, let's put it into perspective by looking at the same level of savings just for the centrifugal chillers. Remember that the maximum kW per ton at ARI standard conditions per 90.1 is 0.576. Now a 2.8% savings would be like changing that ASHRAE 90.1 efficiency to 0.56 kW per ton. To move to 0.55 is a 4.5% savings and a 6.2% savings is like having a chiller rated at 0.54 kW per ton. Uh, chiller manufacturers might work really hard to get performance like this. So the savings shown for the eight cities are significant, even at what might seem like low percentage levels. Now I can share with you that we aren't the only ones who figured this out. I went to grad school with Jim Braun. He later worked for a large controls provider, and he and Mr. Diderick documented a simul similar relationship in 1990. The PG&E Cool Tools program references a paper that shows at different conditions the optimum temperature is different, and that savings of 10% in chiller plus tower operating costs are not uncommon. Kasha and Crowther more recently discussed the same relationships, once from a controls provider, the other from a different chiller manufacturer. So it's well documented that these savings are available. What's the catch? Our gut tells us that the chiller has to work harder than if we drove the water temperature down, and that's true. But there's a trade-off, more tower fan energy consumption. The next gut feel tells us, well, the tower is so much smaller than the chiller that we shouldn't worry about it. But the analysis work done by five different groups, including three control providers and two chiller manufacturers, have analyzed this and shown there are savings. To help our gut feel, think of it this way. The COP of the chiller is between six and seven, and that's really efficient. As we did in the design section earlier in this broadcast, working that ch efficient chiller a little harder is a good thing. But the real answer is, where's the meter? In 23 years, I've never seen a utility meter on the chiller. It's always on the plant or the building. So to reduce the owner's operating costs, we need to look at the entire chilled water plant. Now, to toot our own horn, Train was recently awarded the 2004 Best Sustainable Practice Award for its implementation of near-optimal chiller tower operation. The award is presented each year by the Sustainable Buildings Industry Council and recognizes practices that further the sustainability of buildings in the United States. So, how is this optimal temperature calculated? First, we describe the design conditions for the plant. The design parameters of the cooling tower are its flow rate, range, and approach temperature. Chiller design parameters include power as well as the chiller type. We found that the optimal control set point changes depending on the chiller type because each chiller reacts differently to condenser temperature relief. Finally, at each point in time, we calculate the optimal temperature using the chiller load and the ambient wet bulb temperature. The optimization control strategy is programmed into an energy management system. And most people use variable frequency drive on the cooling tower fans. And to sense ambient humidity, a high quality relative humidity sensor, because the cheap ones go out of calibration pretty quickly. While trace energy and economic analysis software has been capable of analyzing chiller tower optimization since about 1995, some folks believe this design tool to be maybe a little too difficult or time consuming to use. Our simpler system analyzer software just asks you to check a box on one alternative and you can quantify the available savings. The next question many as engineers ask is, 
how do I specify this? The table shown here is from a specification written by Lynn Bellinger, a very good engineer based in New York. Lynn uses it to give her a good idea if the controls provider knows what they're doing. She requires this to be filled out along with the proposal. The two points she examines closely are the 50% operation points with different wet bulbs. Since the optimal point changes with ambient humidity, the tower set point and chiller plus tower energy consumption also changes. To fill out the specification chart, the controls provider needs to understand chillers, how cooling towers are affected by wet bulb, and the interaction between chillers and towers. In a dry climate, you can use the same specification method, but change the wet bulb temperatures. Again, make sure that two 50% load points have significantly different temperatures. So while our system is operating, let's always make sure that we concentrate not just on the chiller, but on the entire system. Optimal control has been available for over a decade now, offers significant savings opportunities, and can be quantified to see if it meets the building owner's economic parameters. We no longer have to rely on gut feel or old past practice. We can provide value to the building owner by helping him or her run their system better and reduce operating costs, energy consumption, and again, power plant emissions. Okay, now the next subject. Varying the condenser water flow is something that more people are considering today. To do so, we must understand the limits to which flow can be varied. First, the pump must run at a speed that produces enough pressure to lift the water from the cooling tower basin to the top of the cooling tower. No flow, no heat rejection. Next, cooling tower manufacturers have a minimum flow rate or pressure requirement to allow proper water distribution across the entire tower. Especially in retrofit applications, a different nozzle may be necessary to get good water distribution throughout the tower fill. If the flow rate drops too far, the heat transfer gets poor due to dry spots in the cooling tower and efficiency suffers. Finally, chillers have a minimum condenser water flow requirement during normal operation. Now let's look at the temperature side. When pump speed and water flow is reduced, this increases the chiller's leaving condenser water temperature. At the same cooling load with less flow, the temperature is higher, which increases chiller power. When water flow through the cooling tower is reduced, the cooling tower effectiveness, its ability to transfer heat, changes. And getting data about how water flow rates change cooling tower heat transfer from the cooling tower manufacturers is sometimes pretty tough. So how should you control the condenser water pump with a variable speed drive? Uh, we have to tell you that we don't have a pat answer for every system today. While well, we've worked with building owners to use variable speed condenser water pumps, we do not have a one-size-fits-all answer today. In fact, it's my opinion that the condenser water pump is the hardest place to put a VFD. An obvious exception is the cold temperature startup control that Lee discussed earlier. Saying that, we have done a few jobs and based the pump speed on the chiller load as measured by the flow and temperature difference. And when combined with variable speed drives on the cooling tower fans, uh, but this control can get pretty complicated. So the specification installation, cooling tower and chiller selections must be considered to arrive at a system control strategy. Now it's time to move to our question and answer session. And thanks for faxing yours in today. Uh, since we've added a special edition broadcast, we're going to be taking a, a, few, a couple fewer questions during this session. Uh, we know your time is valuable and hope this will help you stay around for the special edition broadcast on LEED and refrigerant selection. If we can't get to yours while we're on the air, we will get, to be we will get back to you within uh, about four weeks. Lee, the first one's coming to you. Um, have you considered controlling the tower fans based on the chiller minimum refrigerant pressure differential? Um, we have seen uh, 
specs from time to time where people are controlling uh, cooling tower fans based on the pressure in the chiller and they typically are trying to control it to the minimum uh, allowable refrigerant differential pressure. And what you find is that is just another way to control to the coldest temperature possible. So while it, it could work, uh, we don't see that as a, as a great way to do it. Um, I, I think what Mick talked about in terms of finding a optimum set point and then um, controlling to that in terms of a temperature is much simpler and much easier for an operator, much simpler to implement, much easier for an operator to understand. So I would stay away from that. If you're going to use pressure, uh, use it to, for uh, controlling at the minimum point, but the fans I would control off of temperature. And then if you're going to use it to control at the minimum point, the system has to be set up so that you can do that with some of the configurations you looked at. Sure. The next one's going to come right to me. Um, Lee described an exception to ASHRAE standard 90.1 in regards to fans that serve multiple refrigeration circuits. Would a multiple chiller plan fall into this category? If not, what's meant by multiple refrigeration circuits? Uh, thanks for that question. Hopefully I can clarify it. A multiple chilled water plant would not fall into that exception. Um, what it's really set up for is, say, a piece of air-cooled equipment that has multiple refrigeration circuits with a bunch of small condenser fans. And that's what the exception was put in there for during the re review process for 90.1. There was a particular manufacturer who went to the 90.1 committee, it wasn't us, and said, you know, you missed this one, could you put an exception in? So 90.1 put one in. Uh, Lee, another one coming back to you. When you were talking about the savings with a VFD on a fan, what about the 5 to 10 percent parasitic losses of the VFD, and especially as you get down to lower loads? Sure, um, that's true. The, the curves we showed were ideal, and applying a VFD, you will have the parasitic, the electronics parasitic losses, and you have to take those into account when uh, comparing those to any other control, particularly in this case, he, he talks about two-speed motors. If you, uh, if you run an analysis using a good tool like Trace or System Analyze or some of the other ones out there, DOE, um, they'll take that into account. They'll also take into account the minimum speed requirements of the motors or the, the VFDs. So uh, absolutely you need to be aware of those types of losses. Take them into account. I think what you'll find is almost, hate to do generalities, but almost universally, a VFD is still going to have a, a payback over just about any other control method on a typical sized HVAC system. And really I see a lot of people applying VFDs and a lot of people come back and say they're about the same cost as two-speed motors today. Today they are. And, and they give the smoother control from a temperature standpoint. Yep. Um, Dave, one coming over to you. Uh, does the relationship between lower ambient wet bulb temperatures and result in higher approach temperatures depend on the type of cooling tower used? For example, cross flow versus counter flow. Well, the short answer is no. Um, a little bit longer answer is that both of those types of cooling towers use a direct contact between the water and the air going through there. That's what causes the, um, the heat loss. So as, as, as long as you have that going on, you're going to see this uh, same higher approach with the uh, change in wet bulb. Um, you go to a different kind of tower, now that's going to be a little bit different, but for, for these towers where you have the direct contact of the water with the air, um, no, there's no difference. Okay, thanks a lot, Dave. Uh, Lee, another one coming to you. Can varying the condenser flow rate result in laminar flow through the chiller's condenser? Um, the answer here is yes. Uh, you can go from turbulent flow through transitional into laminar flow on the condenser. What you need to remember is at w the way we talked about lowering flow rates is for the purpose of controlling head pressure or refrigerant differential pressure. And so just because you've gone to transitional or, or laminar flow doesn't mean the heat transfer has stopped. It's gotten a little worse, but that's okay. That actually helps us because now that's going to cause the refrigerant pressure to rise even a little bit more quickly and, and get us in a safe zone a little more quickly. Th the other part to remember here is if we're looking at head pressure, if we're looking or refrigerant differential pressure, 
Um, this is a self-healing situation. If the heat transfer starts to get poor, the head pressure will rise and the controller will say, hey, that's not, uh, I need more flow and it'll open up the valve and then we'll dump more water through the condenser and we'll go back through from laminar up to transitional and, and, and uh, turbulent flow again. So although it can happen, it's really not a bad thing in the circumstances that we were talking about using head pressure as the measured variable, if you will, for this control loop. Uh, thanks, Lee. Another thing I'd like to make sure we understand is that when we go to reduce flow design, that doesn't mean that we'd select the same chiller. We're probably going to select a different chiller and its flow rate will be above, above the minimum design conditions. So let's not confuse the operation with the, the design selection. And that's going to have to be our last question for today. So in review today, uh, we saw Dave's presentation on cooling tower basics. Two things to remember are that towers can be selected at any range or delta T. When we increase that range, the result is either a smaller tower or closer approach temperature. The second aha is that as the ambient wet bulb drops, the approach temperature increases. So it's harder than you may have thought to make tower water cold. During the design portion of the broadcast, we saw that many in the industry, including consulting engineers, utilities, and ASHRAE have found that reducing condenser water flow rates can result in systems that have lower capital and operating costs. And there are environmental benefits due to less material and lower energy use. Uh, Lee showed us that using variable frequency drives properly is beneficial and also covered some design configurations that can be used with any manufacturer's chiller. Finally, we covered the optimal tower set point and found significant savings available in many locations. I know that at least three system control providers ha have already offered this type of control, so there's no need to worry about getting competitive bids. There are a number of publications available so that you can further investigate today's topics. Uh, ASHRAE, Marley's website, and the Cooling Technology Institute's Tower Rating Standard all give good general information. We've also put together a bibliography detailing third-party articles. This is available from your local site coordinator. As always, we value your feedback and hope you'll fill out an evaluation before you leave. As for the rest of this year, we have three more broadcasts scheduled for 2005. LEAD, Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, continues to be a topic of interest to many in our industry. Our February 2004 broadcast covered possible ways to achieve points within the HVAC realm. In May, we'll be back to cover another LEAD topic, how the energy analysis needs to be performed to gain LEAD credit points. ASHRAE Standard 62, 2004 ventilation requirements will be our topic in September. And in November, we're slated to discuss CO2-based demand-controlled ventilation. I'll be back in 10 minutes with our ENL Special Edition so we can share what's changed with respect to refrigerant selection and the lead process. Thank you for joining us today. We'll see you either in 10 minutes or in May.